Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is titled, After the Storm, Building for High Wind Resistance. My name is Tom Kozitsky, and I will serve as moderator for this session. And our speaker, Mary Ewer, and I, we both work for APA, the Engineered Wood Association. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood construction systems and educates users and specifiers on the product's proper use and potential applications. Before we get too far along, I do want to plug our next webinar. It's titled Shearwall Analysis Made Easy. As you can probably tell, it's primarily intended for engineers. It will cover recent APA shearwall research and the development of a new free shearwall calculator, which is based on the force transfer around openings design methodology. It will be held at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern on May 10th. I'll provide more information on how to be notified about that webinar at the end of the session. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Mary's presentation will last about 50 minutes. To ensure that everyone can hear it clearly, we have muted all participants. We do encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel on your screen. We should have time to answer most questions, but if we run short, we'll be sure to post a Q&A summary on our website, along with the recorded version of today's program. We should have those posted in a week or so. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for AIA and ICC continuing education credits. Following the webinar, an email will be sent to each attendee. It will include a link where you can get customized AIA or ICC Certificates of Completion. Our presenter today is Mary Ewer, Eastern Region Manager for APA based in Baltimore, Maryland. Mary oversees a team of engineers and engineered wood specialists who educate and consult on engineered wood use and construction applications. In that role, they work with designers, building officials, and builders on various engineered wood products that are used in buildings today. Mary's consulting engineering background involves a wide variety of commercial, residential, and infrastructure projects. While she lives in Baltimore, she has Midwestern roots, having received her degree in civil engineering from the University of Nebraska. For those of you just joining us, welcome to APA's webinar on the topic of building for high wind resistance. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Mary Ewer. Thank you, Tom, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today. APA has years of field experience in observing damage from high wind events. Today, we're gonna to focus mostly on tornadoes, but the recommendations we're gonna discuss would be effective during any high wind event. As Tom mentioned, today's seminar is approved for AIA CEUs, and those certificates and information on them will be provided by email. ICC CEUs are also available. You've all seen the course description at the time of registration. So instead of going through this in a whole lot of detail, let's take a quick look at the learning objectives. We have four learning objectives today. The first is to recognize the fundamental behavior of wood structures during high wind events. The second is to identify some of the common failure modes that we see during these events. And then we're going to talk about some preventative methods that you can use to help reduce some of the damage that we're going to use as examples today. And finally, we're going to discuss the importance of a complete load path. My engineering background makes me think that this one is probably the most important. Before we jump into my slides, we're going to run two quick poll questions. The first one is asking what your occupation is. This information allows us to tailor our future presentations and publications to the right audience. So it's really helpful to get answers here. It looks like we have a pretty good number of people starting to vote. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Is Mary the only one that can see the in input? 
Am I the only one that can see it? It looks like we have about 70% engineers uh, right now and about 10% architects, 9% um, code officials, some builders, and the, some others. It looks like we have about 90% of the votes in, so I'll go ahead and close this poll. Thank you very much. And then second poll is how many people are watching at your machine? Again, this just helps us get a feel for the number of attendees. I know a number of you are maybe watching in conference rooms. I actually spoke to one of my firms in Omaha who's watching in a conference room, so I appreciate that. It looks like most of you are at your computers, which is great. That's part of the reason that we've started doing so many webinars. It's really great to be able to not have to travel or set anything special up. Wonderful. Thank you guys very much for that information. All right, jumping now into my slides. APA has developed design and construction recommendations that are based off of damage observed following storms. We're going to look at the storms in, discussed in each of the damage reports shown here, as well as a few others. When observing storms, we look for patterns in the failures to determine the most common first failure point. Today, we're going to look at images from each storm and relate them back to their initial load path failure, which will be done working from the top of a house down. The details in our Building for High Wind Resistance guides contribute to improved overall performance in the structural shell and focus on good connection details to tie together exterior walls, roofs, and floors. Some of these design recommendations exceed minimum code requirements and typical APA recommendations. Since the publication of these guidelines in 2011, they've been incorporated into local building codes, such as the Georgia Disaster Resilient Building Code. Estimates by the Georgia Department of Community Affairs concluded that the additional cost represented by these enhancements is less than $600 for an average 2,100 square foot, one story, single family home. Of course, APA isn't the only group that performs damage assessments or has high wind resistance guidelines. Some of the reports and recommendations put together by others can be seen here. The first storm used during today's seminar is a tornado that occurred in southwest Missouri in 2003. There were a number of tornadoes that occurred as part of this outbreak. APA evaluated the damage along a path where the storm was rated as an EF3 at its strongest. The next storm event we're going to talk about is an outbreak that occurred throughout the South in April of 2011. Many of you might remember this as the storm outbreak that hit the University of Alabama. Our observations following this storm were focused in North Carolina, which is pictured here, and Alabama. The day after Christmas of 2015, an EF4 tornado went through North Texas. APA was able to observe this damage shortly after the event and I was part of the, this assessment team. Again, in Texas, a little over a year ago, there was a storm that damaged a number of houses. This one was a bit different because instead of a tornado, this damage was caused by straight line winds. In June of 2017, two storms hit south of Omaha, Nebraska, and I was on site to observe this, observe this damage. Being a native Nebraskan and one who lived and worked in Omaha for many years, this one hit especially close to home for me. In fact, I was able to stay with my sister just a few miles down the road while completing the observation. Shortly after returning home from observing the Nebraska storm last summer, a tornado touched down in Maryland, about 30 miles from my current house. The damage in this EF1 storm was not as severe because the path was really short, but there were still some valuable lessons learned. And finally, earlier this month, we were able to observe storm damage in northern Tennessee. We're still evaluating the findings of this storm, but I do have a few pictures included today. Before we get started looking at damage, let's talk a little bit about tornadoes. The Fujita scale is intended to help classify tornadoes according to intensity based on the damage that's observed. This is because measurements of actual wind speeds in tornadoes are very difficult to perform. From this table, you can see that tornadoes up to EF2 have wind speeds similar to typical hurricane design wind speeds. Structures can be designed for tornadoes using much the same approach as for hurricanes. And for that reason, many of the details in our guide 
may look familiar to those of you that are used to designing along the coast. Following the performance of the newer homes during Hurricane Irma last fall, we know that many of them are successful in resisting winds of this speed. You can also see the descriptions of the expected damage on the right. For an ES2 tornado, roofs of well-constructed homes are expected to be damaged and large trees are expected to be snapped or uprooted. These are the two damage indicators that we use in most of our observations, and we'll talk about them more in just a minute. A couple of additional tornado facts. One of the things that most people don't realize is that 96% of all tornadoes have a rating of EF2 or less. As just mentioned, an EF2 tornado has wind speeds approaching 135 miles per hour at the maximum point. However, the winds on the outer edges of those storms are usually much, much slower. We often hear that it isn't possible to design for tornadoes, but with 96% of them having a maximum wind speed of just 135 miles an hour, it is possible to significantly improve performance in these storms. It's impractical to protect against a direct hit from an EF4 or EF5 tornado, and even some EF3s. However, even in those storms, improvement in the performance of homes can be seen in areas of the storms with lower wind speeds. And finally, regarding safe rooms, in the southeastern US, tornadoes often travel at night, which makes them less visible and more likely to catch occupants asleep. Even in the daytime, Tornadoes are often difficult to see coming no matter where you're located. Tornado sirens and other warning systems are not a given and depend largely on local infrastructure for implementation. Because of this, protecting the building shell is really the best way to keep occupants safe. I mentioned a few slides ago that wind speeds are estimated following an observation of the damage. There are 28 different damage indicators that are used during an observation. A damage indicator is a group of objects that can be used to evaluate the severity of a tornado. The larger the degree of damage, the higher the wind speed and corresponding tornado rating. The primary damage indicators used in analysis for most residential one or two family residences for most residential areas are one or two family residences and hardwood trees because those are the two that apply in most subdivisions. So let's look a little bit more at those two. When looking at the damage indicator for one and two family residences, the damage is evaluated based on a well-constructed home and the components of a home shown here, including the roof covering type, the sheathing and framing used, the different types of geometries that can be used on a roof, and similar aspects of walls as well. You can see here the different degrees of damage for this damage indicator. When all the walls are gone, it's correlated to a lower bound wind speed of 142 miles per hour and an upper bound wind speed of 198 miles per hour. This is essentially an EF3 or EF4 storm. Keep in mind again that this is of a well-constructed home, which can be really hard to identify. Because of this, we often look at the trees as a more reliable damage indicator. Here, you can see the degrees of damage for hardwood trees which includes oak, maple, and birch. Note that when limbs up to one inch are broken, the wind speeds are expected to vary between 48 and 72 miles per hour. Keep in mind that these are the two damage indicators we're really gonna focus on today because they're the two we see in subdivisions. When looking at the homes and trees in this area, the wind speed is likely in the high ES3 range. The trees are debarked and snapped many cars were flipped, and the homes are completely destroyed. Looking at the vegetation and homes in this area, there were likely wind speeds that ranged from a high EF1 to a low EF2. The trees and homes seem to be in agreement when you look at this photo. In this picture, you can see that the homes are gone, but the trees are in pretty good shape. And remember, this is in December, so there weren't any leaves there to begin with. In this case, the hardwood tree indicator is probably a better estimate of the wind speed than the single family home indicator. Upon further inspection in this area, we found a number of significant construction deficiencies that likely contributed to the failures. And in this case, you can see that the opposite has happened. The homes are in good shape, but some of the trees are completely destroyed. This was the case throughout this entire neighborhood which was rated as an EF1 by the National Weather Service. 
Upon further inspection, it was possible to see that there was carpenter ant damage to tree interiors throughout the entire neighborhood. The presence of carpenter ants had weakened the structure of the tree and makes the homes the more reliable damage indicator in this case. So during storm observations, maps like this are often created. All storms are rated according to their strongest point on the path. Here, the 2011 storm in Alabama was rated as an EF4 for the entire path. But looking at this picture, you can see that there are a variety of wind speeds observed. There are a few areas where the storm is rated as an EF3 or EF4, shown in red and orange, but more often the damage indicates a wind speed of EF2 or below. In most cases, it's unrealistic to design for those red and orange areas, but paying attention to a few small construction details can really increase the performance of homes. Most people who survived this storm will tell you they survived an EF4 tornado, which is technically true, but very few of them actually experienced EF4 wind speeds. Here we have another example of that same concept. This map shows the estimated EF rating based on a detailed survey in 2015 in Texas. As can be seen from this graphic, the wind speeds vary quite a bit along the even that short segment of the tornado path. Even though some buildings were subjected to EF4 forces, the majority of those affected by the event were in winds estimated at EF2 or below. In fact, many of the pictures we're gonna look at today fall in the EF0 or EF1 range. So I mentioned earlier that the majority of tornadoes are rated at EF2 or below, with over 95% of all tornadoes estimated to fall in this range. What that really means is that at their strongest point, 95% of all tornadoes have a maximum wind speed of 135 miles per hour, and 85% of all tornadoes are estimated to have a maximum wind speed of less than 110 miles per hour, meaning that these storms can be designed for all along their path, but the homes at the outer edges can likely survive with very little damage if a bit of extra care is taken. Before we start talking about how to design for storms, it's important to understand what a load path is. There are two kinds of load paths, vertical and lateral, that both need to be complete for a structure to be properly designed. They're required in both the IBC and the IRC. Section 1604.4 of the 2018 IBC states that an analysis shall result in a system that provides a complete load path capable of transferring loads from their point of origin to the load resisting elements. So let's take a look, a look first at the gravity load path and see what that really means. The vertical or gravity load path is a load path that's a little bit easier to understand. A load path is simply the path that the load takes as it passes through the structure and its components and connections on its way to the ground. In the vertical load path, members above bear on members below, thereby transferring loads from above all the way to the foundation. So the load enters the building through the roof. The roof rafters then transfer the load to a ridge beam. That ridge beam sits on a post on each end. Maybe that post sits on a header. The header is supported by jack studs. The jack studs sit on a sill plate, which sits on a foundation. And finally, the foundation transfers the load from the roof into the ground. A load path is only as strong as its weakest link. Whichever member or connection is the weakest will be the first point of failure. A failure in the gravity load path is easy to see. In this case, the joist that's cut obviously doesn't work. Any building, regardless of its size or location, must be safely designed to resist not only the gravity loads, but all structural loads anticipated during its lifetime. Lateral loads are forces that act on the side of a house parallel to the ground. During a wind event, the wind pushes one end wall while pulling on the wall on the opposite side. The walls on the other two sides of the structure, the bracing walls, must hold the roof from moving. If we turned this house on its side, would it stay together when the wind we just looked at blew on it? The connections that resist gravity loads are not adequate to hold the house together if it were turned on its side. Think of lateral forces as when a house is tipped this way or when the loads are acting sideways. Here we see the wind load acting on the side of a building. 
These loads also need to be transferred through members and connections to the ground. And again, whichever link of the load path is the weakest will be the failure point of the structure. One of the critical members of the lateral load path are braced wall panels or shear walls, which resist lateral loads to prevent the house from racking or collapsing. Lateral load path failures often aren't quite as easy to see, but we're gonna see a number of examples throughout the, area, throughout the hour. There are three types of failures from lateral loads, all of which are resisted by ensuring that the load path is properly designed and installed. The bracing or shear walls need to be designed to prevent racking. They need to be connected to the foundation properly through anchor bolts to resist base shear, and there needs to be enough resistance to overturning through a combination of dead load and hold down. We'll see examples of all three of these failure methods today. We are finally to the point that we're gonna dig into our storm observations and what they've taught us. We're going to do so by using the APA above code methods that improve the performance of homes during high wind events. We'll step through the details shown in this document and talk about how they re relate to the failures that we're seeing as well as the load path. Detail A in our publication is the attachment of the roof sheathing. The IRC requires a minimum nailing of six inches at the panel edges and 12 inches along intermediate framing. We recommend changing that to four inches at the perimeter and six inches in the field. Let's start out by looking at how this area performs during storms. Often, roof failures seen look a lot like this, where only part of the sheathing is removed. At this home, the roof sheathing was removed from the trusses due to a suction force. A few additional nails could have helped resist this failure. Here, you can see that the garage door has breached and the roof sheathing is gone from almost the entire roof. Notice that the fence is still standing along the side of the house. Garage door and window failures present a unique challenge during storms. Homes are designed to resist wind loads as an enclosed structure, meaning the wind is not expected to act from inside a building. When a garage door fail fails, the amount of wind on the structure increases dramatically as there's now wind pulling from the outside and pushing from the inside, causing the nails holding the roof sheathing to fail and withdraw. An often overlooked vulnerability for roof sheathing occurs at step-down hip trusses like we see in this photo. Since the top cord of the truss is not parallel with the roof sheathing in this case, the fastening is more difficult to accomplish successfully. It's probably a good idea to use one size larger nails at step-down trusses to ensure adequate fastener penetration. Another challenge is roof sheathing staples. And here in Nebraska, they can be seen removed from the truss. Staples are often installed with the legs perpendicular to the truss, as seen here. This installation is incorrect. The staples should be installed parallel to truss cords for the best performance. Also keep in mind that when staples are used, the spacing will need to be adjusted for the difference in withdrawal capacity. Unfortunately, tarp roofs like the one shown here in Maryland are an all too common site following a windstorm. This is usually due to a loss of a combination of shingles and sheathing. The sheathing loss is easy to prevent, especially in storms the strength of the one experienced in Maryland. As mentioned earlier, the IRC requires nailing the roof sheathing at six inches at the perimeter and 12 inches in the field. Our recommendation for increased performance at this location is to change the fastening from six inches at the perimeter and 12 inches in the field to fastening at four inches on the perimeter of the panels and six inches along the intermediate framing. The additional nails help the roof sheathing stay attached to the trusses or rafters when uplift or suction loads are experienced. We also recommend the use of an eight penny ring or screw shank nail. The deformed shank nails really help with roof sheathing attachment. They have a higher withdrawal strength and represent a small cost increase to the builder and homeowner. Continuing to move down the building, the next above code details in APA's high wind publication relate to gable, width, gable ends. This is a very common failure point in storms. There are two recommendations at gable ends. First, the bottom of the truss needs to be braced to resist the hinge as shown by the arrow. When the wind blows on the gable end, the joint between the top plate of the wall 
and the bottom cord of the gable end truss is a weak point, and the load path is a weak point that bracing helps resist. Second, we recommend that all gables are sheathed with wood structural panels. Again, let's start by looking at some failures before we really dig into our recommended details. Gable end failure is common on homes subjected to high wind forces. In this case, minimal fastening was observed between the bonus room floor sheathing, which is also the top plate of the garage wall, and the bottom of the gable end truss. The floor sheathing would have functioned as an excellent tie to the lateral load path in this area if proper attention had been paid to the detail. But since there wasn't a good attachment, we saw a traditional hinge here. Let's take a look at some hinges that are maybe a little bit easier to picture. Here, you can clearly see the hinge point in the wall at the base of the gable, which fell inward at this home. In this case, the roof sheathing attachment was likely inadequate, resulting in the failure here. This home in Nebraska looks to be in pretty good shape on first glance but further observation shows just how removed the gable end is from the sidewall. Let's take a closer look. You can see here that the gable is almost a foot off the wall. This home was only about two months old when the tornado hit. The home's reported to have rotated off its foundation as well, but that damage was not able to be captured in photos. When speaking with this homeowner's father, he reported to me that at the ceilings in both the basement and on the main level, you were able to see light around the entire perimeter of the house, which indicated a connection failure in these two critical locations of the load path. In this case, the failure was a combination of the gable end and the garage doors. When the garage doors breached, the additional pressure on the sidewall from that wind getting into the building caused a failure at the hinge point in the wall. You can see the gable end truss on the ground here, and on further inspection, I was unable to find any indication of bracing in this garage. And this house had a very classic gable failure. It was still under construction at the time of the storm, and you can see that the roof sheathing and shingles performed pretty well, but the sidewall and gable truss are gone. A closer look shows the flexible wall sheathing tearing at the rim, but the roof sheathing above is still whole. This home was under construction in the same subdivision, and it's easy to see here that there is not any bracing at this hinge point other than interior walls, which are really only bracing the wall, not the gable and truss. The IRC requires that homes are constructed with a complete load path, and unless the bracing was going to be installed later, I certainly didn't see a load path that was complete in this area. Our above code detail helps here and ties that hinge to the roof trusses, and allows the lateral loads to be transferred up into the roof diaphragm. In this detail, we have a two by four brace that race, rests on the gable end truss and then sits on three interior truss bottom cords, plus about an extra six inches of length. That brace is nailed to each truss bottom cord with three 10 penny nails. Then between the gable end truss and the first interior truss, there's an additional piece of two by four flat wise blocking between the bottom cords. Finally, there is a tension tie strap attached to the exterior of the wall and brought up over the blocking that was just installed. One of these braces should be located every six feet along the gable end. As I mentioned a moment ago, interior walls can be used, but some additional detailing may be needed with them as well. This detail covers one of the gable failures we see, but there are two. Sometimes gable end damage appears less severe, like at this home in Texas. In this case, a suction force on this face of the house, which was the leeward face, removed the non-structural sheathing from the gable end. Failures like the one shown here allow water infiltration in the attic and can result in costly repairs for homeowners. Ideally, gable end failures will look like this one in Maryland, where the vinyl siding was lost, but the home performed well overall. In this photo, you can see the hinge point at the gable starting to fail, but the wood structural panel sheathing on the gable end and the bracing they have at the hinge point prevented water infiltration and allowed the homeowners to continue to occupy their home. We recommend using wood structural panels on your gable ends. 
By continuously sheathing your gable with wood structural panels, you minimize damage due to projectiles, and on top of that, you minimize that water infiltration. We recommend you nail this sheathing at the same four inches at the panel perimeter and six inches in the field to minimize the risk of failure due to nail withdrawal when the gable is subjected to suction loads like we just saw a minute ago. This detail not only allows for a stronger gable end, but also provides a solid nail base for the siding and trim. If we continue to move down the wall, or really around the wall in this case, we're gonna keep talking about top plates. We talked about them a bit on gable ends, but let's look at the truss to top plate connection next. This is a crucial connection, and we recommend the use of a hurricane or seismic anchor in this location. At this building in Missouri, the roof trusses could be seen on the ground. The only attachment of these roof trusses to the top plate was toenails, which do not provide much strength in uplift. It was common to see large sections of roof on the ground during this storm, similar to the one shown here. Seeing a large section like this on the ground indicates that the connection between the top plate and the rafter is the obvious weak point in the load path. The roof sections observed were attached with toenails. Let's take a closer look at toenails. The failure of the connection here is probably the result of an uplift force. I think most of us have probably pulled a nail out of a stud and understand that the withdrawal strength of a nail is not its strongest connection. In addition to this, toenails align along the grain and they can contribute to splitting of the top plate during installation, which causes the withdrawal capacity to, re to drop even more. The roof of this home was lost and resulted in a massive loss of value. An inexpensive metal connector would have likely prevented this. These metal twist straps work well for uplift, holding the rafters to the top plate but they pulled the top plate off the wall supporting them. The connectors here were put on the inside face of the top plate, marked with the red arrow. We recommend to put the strap on the outside face of the wall, marked with the blue arrow and lying on the ground. This puts the anchor in line with the wood structural panel wall sheathing, which is a vital part of the uplift load path. Since the connectors here were installed on the inside face of the wall, the uplift force causes rotation in the top plate member, resulting in an interruption in the load path. If the connectors are located correctly on the outside of the wall, the uplift force transfers directly into the wall sheathing. At this home under construction in Texas, we observed that there were clips installed, but the framer had nailed through the steel instead of into the holes provided by the clip manufacturer. This weakens the connector and is a contributing cause to this failure. This picture shows an obvious load path failure at the top plate. Most of the sheathing, roof, and even shingles and gable ends are still in place, but the entire roof has moved a significant distance off the walls. The same thing happened at this home. The upper top plate and roof are completely gone, and we were unable to locate them. In this image, you can also see that the flexible wall sheathing does not lap the top plate, causing the walls and the connection to perform differently than the designer might have expected. These two homes show that same short sheathing, as well as showing the top top plate being lifted off the bottom top plate. Connecting structural wall sheathing properly to both top plates, but even more importantly, the top top plate, can help eliminate this failure. In Nebraska, you can see that at this house, the roof trusses were well connected to both top plates using truss screws from underneath. These screws were about six inches in length and obviously were not the weak link in the load path. Looking more closely, the sheathing was connected only to the bottom top plate and the non-structural sheathing tore away from the staples causing the failure point to be between the top plates and the walls. If you look closely, you can see the nails from the stud still pointing straight down from the top plate. Failures like this show the importance of this attachment along the entire length of the wall, not just at the wall bracing locations. Our high wind recommendations in this area assume that you're properly transferring the shear as is required by the building codes. But we also recommend a framing anchor that attaches to each top plate 
and has both uplift and shear capacity. They greatly outperform toenails for this connection. As we continue to move down the house, the next place we often see failures is at a rim board between the stories of a home. There are a lot of options to resist uplift loads at this location, which is the failure that we see most often. Our recommendation in our high wind publication is to nail the upper and lower story sheathing to a common rim board. And we'll discuss that and a few others after we look at some failures. Flexible wall sheathing was used on the side walls of this home with a small amount of OSD corner bracing on the front of the home. The flexible sheathing has performed poorly in this relatively minor wind event. Note nearby vegetation and fencing that appears to be in fairly good shape. Those trees in the foreground were brought into the yard from the street to allow access for vehicles. A common wood structural panel wall sheathing on both the top and bottom story would have likely performed much better in this case. Here, you can see that the entire second story is gone. The non-structural sheathing at the front of the home has torn and allowed the wall to fall. Also, when structural panel sheathing is used, we see the walls on a second story remaining in place, even when the roof is removed. Failures in this location with non-structural sheathing are another trend that we see in many storms. Here you can see that the flexible sheathing has torn along the rim and the wall has fallen. And here, the entire roof and the exterior walls on the second story were removed by wind, likely due to insufficient connections at the roof to top plate and at the rim board, in addition to the flexible wall sheathing. Rim board connections aren't the only time we see issues at story to story connections. In this home, there was a two story living room at the front of the house. Two story rooms are another area where it's important to pay attention and avoid those hinges we discussed with gable ends. In this example, you can see a hinge failure here. With two-story platform frame houses, the hinge between stories is a weak point that we see much too often. This home was constructed as a single-story home in the 1970s, and the second floor was added later. You can see the damage to this transitional area following a storm with fairly low wind speeds. In addition to the missing siding, there was differential rotation between the first and second stories, and the cavity insulation could be seen peeking through in quite a few locations. To prevent failures like these, there are quite a few options. As shown in these pictures, you can nail upper and lower story sheathing into a common rim board. This is the detail recommended in our high wind resistance guide. You can also use the sheathing to span over the rim board and attach it to the studs above and below the, the floor to resist the loads here. Or of course, using straps is an option as well. We have a system report that covers using your wood structural panel wall sheathing for combined shear and uplift, and it provides details, capacities, and design examples. The next thing we're gonna talk about is wall sheathing and how that can be used to resist loads experienced during storms. Wall sheathing is another location where the code minimum installation is providing wood structural panels or another wall bracing method at required locations with a nailing pattern of six inches at the perimeter and 12 inches in the field. Our recommendation is to continuously sheathe all walls with wood structural panels, including gable ends and above and below openings. All wood structural panel wall sheathing should be attached with nails at four inches at the panel edges and ends and six inches in the field. Let's take a look at why that's our recommendation. Continuously sheathing with wood structural panels helps prevent failures like the one shown here, which was caused by projectiles, which are very common in high wind events. You can see the difference in performance between the non-structural sheathing on the left and the OSB corner bracing on the right. Projectiles cause a lot of damage in storms, and wood structural panel sheathing helps minimize the damage and the potential water infiltration. Flying debris creates a real danger during high wind events. Here you can see the debris, likely a stud in this case, has caused a tear in both the siding and the sheathing. While such damage is more common with non-structural sheathing and vinyl siding, some flying projectiles will penetrate almost any wall assembly. And of course, there's always the risk of them hitting that window. 
this home was continuously sheathed with wood structural panels. And while the two by four penetrated, the damage was less severe than what we saw previously. You can also see a piece of OSB sheathing from the construction site nearby, which is also penetrated. The walls of this home provided greater protection to its occupants. In Missouri, you can see that the house that is continuously sheathed with wood structural panels in the foreground performs very well compared to the house in the background. This home was observed following the straight line winds in Texas in 2017. There was a brick veneer on the home that failed, which allowed the flexible sheathing to tear in many locations. Issues like this were seen throughout the entire site. So let's think back to our lateral force failure methods. Walls don't just stop projectiles. They're also used to resist the shear loads that happen during hurricanes, tornadoes, or earth earthquakes. Wall bracing, or shear walls, are the tools that are used to resist racking. Let's take a look at some racking failures. At this home, the second floor was well designed to resist the loads from this storm and stayed mostly intact. The first floor, however, was underdesigned and collapsed. This type of failure is called a soft story failure. At this home in Texas, the racking is evident throughout the entire structure. This home also experienced significant uplift. Narrow walls at garage doors are another common place for failures. This home had inadequate wall bracing or shear walls in this area and racked due to the high wind loads. This is the first home where I was able to experience such traditional racking in person. And while looking at someone's house completely destroyed is never fun, it was a very interesting thing for me to observe in person and I was able to learn a lot from the damage. Let's talk a little bit more about narrow walls. One version of a narrow wall detail, a portal frame, is shown here. It's important to note that these are not an above code detail, but instead an option in the IRC for resisting lateral loads at these challenging narrow walls. We have a technical topic on portal frames that can be downloaded from our website, and it provides capacities of the portal frame assemblies which have been tested in our lab. Portal frames are created by extending the header over the wall as far as is required by your design needs. The sheathing, which should be continuous or spliced only near the mid height of the open, opening, should then be nailed to the header and the studs with a three inch on center nailing pattern. On the inside of the wall, a strap is needed to resist the loads on that face. Portal frames and other narrow wall bracing methods are a complex topic, so we're not gonna get into a lot of detail today. However, let's look back at that racking picture that I saw in Texas and point out the most obvious failure in the load path. Looking back, you can now see that there's a seam in the wall sheathing right at the top of the opening, meaning that in this case, it wasn't acting as a portal at all. At this home, the narrow wall failed, which blew out the perpendicular wall and damaged the house. This again allowed the inside to be pressurized due to winds entering it, which will greatly affect the amount of damage. Here in Nebraska, the garage doors were the first point of failure. The sidewall of the garage then blew out. The home itself, however, performed pretty well. You can see that the continuous sheathing here ensured that there was sheathing left to act as a shear wall, even when the garage sidewall was blown out, which allowed the homeowners to access the interior to retrieve belongings, and start the recovery process quickly. They did have some interior water damage due to projectiles going through windows, but their belongings, and more importantly, their lives were safe. At this house, which was a model home in a brand new subdivision, you can see that the flexible wall sheathing has been pulled off the studs by the brick veneer. It's a common misconception that brick makes your home stronger, but most of today's brick walls are just a veneer, and are supported by the wall sheathing and framing. The brick doesn't support the wall. The structural wall assembly supports the brick. During this storm in Texas, we also saw a number of homes with cracks or failures in the brick veneer at the corner. This was due to a combination of factors, including inadequate connections and excessive movement of the structure behind the brick under lateral loads. 
Looking a little bit more at brick ties, we also saw a number of homes with improperly installed brick ties that resulted in serious failures of the veneers at low wind speeds. In this location, the home was recently constructed, and though brick ties were installed on the flexible sheathing, one of which is circled here, they were not bent down and installed into the brick, which allowed the brick to fail under low wind speeds. Look at the performance of the shingles compared to the brick wall. At this home in Texas, the brick ties failed due to the movement of its home off its foundation. There were ties that could be seen both, in the, both attached to the wall and still located in the brick. So APA recommends sheathing all walls, including gable ends, with wood structural panels. Typical nail installations are six inches at the perimeter and 12 inches in the field, but for high wind resiliency, nailing at four inches at panel edges and ends and six inches in the field can increase the performance of walls. Shear wall performance is greatly affected by the nailing pattern and just a few more nails have a huge impact. Continuously sheathing with wood structural panels also minimizes projectile damage as well as allowing for the attachment of lightweight siding and trim without the need to hit a stud, which can sometimes be hard to find. In addition to our publication that covers lightweight siding and trim, the 2018 IRC recognizes the ability of a minimum 7 16th category panel being used as a nail base, nail base for brick ties, as shown here in table R703.8.4.2, which we aren't gonna look at in detail, but I did want you to know is there. The final but no less critical load path item to consider is the sill plate and anchor bolt connections. Here, our recommendations include ensuring that the sheathing laps the sill plate and is properly nailed at the four inches previously mentioned, as well as locating half inch anchor bolts at 32 to 48 inches on center with a three by three plate washer at each bolt. These two connections help us resist base shear, which is a failure that we see often. This home is approximately 20 feet by 30 feet and was built in the 1940s or 50s. The wind slid the home from its foundation, the right side of which is marked here with an arrow. A closer look at that foundation shows that the home was built on a block stem wall. Our observations did not reveal any anchor bolts or solid poured cells in the CMU, which allowed for a very classic base shear failure. Here is another example of walls and a roof that were well designed with inadequate anchorage. You can build a very strong box, but if it's not properly connected, you still get a failure. You can see another ungrouted CMU foundation wall in this picture, which indicates a lack of anchor bolts. At this home in Texas, the entire home was removed from the foundation you can see the relatively good performance of the homes surrounding this slab. We were able to walk the entire perimeter of this slab on grade foundation. And what we found is that there were no anchor bolts holding the sill plate to the slab. In Texas, sill plates are often attached with powder actuated fasteners. The fasteners that were installed in this instance did not provide adequate embedment into the foundation and allow for failures like this. A storage pod that was being unloaded at the home next door came through this garage and spalled the concrete out of the anchor bolt. There likely would have been no preventing this failure because a half loaded pod packs a lot of strength, but the well installed anchor bolts probably helped other houses by this same builder in this neighborhood. This is the same home in Maryland that we looked at earlier where a second story was added to a single story 1970s home. When the second story was added, the amount of force from wind is increased and the anchorage was likely not taken into account. It allowed this home to move over 10 feet off its foundation. In speaking with the owner of this house, she told me that much of her furniture inside was still in the correct place and she had no water damage, but her house did move 10 feet off its foundation following an EF1 storm. This left her not only homeless, but affected her business since she ran an in-home daycare. I guarantee she would have rather spent the money to put in additional anchorage when she added a second story than deal with the aftermath of this storm. 
To prevent these base shear failures, we recommend that anchor bolt spacing is tightened to between 32 and 48 inches on center compared to the code minimum 72 inches on center. These anchor bolts should be properly embedded into your foundation, and we recommend a 3x3 plate washer at each bolt. This helps prevent a standard washer and nut from pulling through the sill plate, as well as helping with some cross-grain bending that we'll talk about more in just a second. In this image, you can see that while anchor bolts were installed, they were located at approximately eight foot on center, and they did not have a plate washer, which allowed the entire wall, including the sill plate, to separate from its foundation. I know it's hard, if not impossible, to see in this picture, but the nuts were still in place on these bolts. In this picture, the sill plate stayed mostly in place, but the wall sheathing is pulled away. You'll notice there's a strip of wall sheathing approximately six inches wide that was located along the bottom marked with an arrow. That joint in the sheathing should ideally be located nearer to mid height or blocked to strengthen the connection. Another common error is the lack of nails from the sheathing to the sill plate as seen in this photo. You can see the mostly intact wall and the sill still attached to the foundation. Looking closely at the locations where the sheathing and sill plate were touching, you can see that there don't appear to be any fasteners at this critical location. Here's another example of that important connection. In this case, there were no nails that attached the sheathing to the sill plate, and even though the plate was missing plate washers, it remained well anchored. However, the home still failed. We looked along the whole length of the sill plate and saw no nails or nail holes. This home lifted off the sill plate and moved over a foot off its foundation. That's interior carpet you see below the tape measure. Taking a closer look at the connection, you can see here that the flexible wall sheathing tore away from the staples, which allowed the nails holding the studs to the sill plate to fail and withdraw. In the Nebraska storm, the sill plate detail was interesting. The lower sill plate was properly installed with plate washers, but an upper sill plate was nailed to that. The sheathing was only connected to the upper sill plate, and you can see the staples from that non-structural sheathing remaining in the sill. A structural sheathing would have likely created a better connection here, though it still should have been fastened to the sill plate that's connected with anchor bolts, in this case, the lower one. Just about a month ago in Tennessee, we observed a similar detail. The bottom plate, is fastened to a sill with two 16 penny common nails somewhere between 12 and 24 inches on center. The mud sill is then anchored to the stem wall. You can also see that at the sill plate here, there's a narrow strip of sheathing at the bottom. On the far right, there is blocking, so that's probably a braced wall panel, but it would still be better if that panel edge was located nearer to mid height. This home was under construction on the far side of the neighborhood from the tornado. Based on this wall where that was in the path of the tornado, you can see that the sheathing was attached only to the top sill plate, not to the plate connected to the foundation with anchor bolts. This was true at both plates in this case. The sheathing was only attached to the upper sill plate and the lower top plate, allowing for failures of nails and withdrawal between plates and resulting in seeing whole walls on the ground like this one. Let's look back at our anchor bolt detail. The items we've already discussed are grayed out. So the additional things we need to do are provide wood structural panels along the entire length to help transfer uplift. That panel should be connected to a sill plate that's anchored to the foundation with nails at four inches on center. This nail transfers the load from the wood structural panel to the sill, and this is one of the places that plate washer helps. The load transfer through that nail causes cross grain bending in the sill, and the plate washer helps resist it. While this is only required in the IRC at wall bracing locations, having this wood structural panel to sill plate connection at the entire perimeter of your home has a huge impact on the overall performance. So putting both important parts of this detail together, this is what the final detail should look like. The anchor bolts are embedded in the foundation at 32 to 48 inches on center and have a three by three plate washer at each anchor bolt. The continuously sheathed walls should then be nailed to the sill plate at four inches on center. The extension of the sheathing to the bolted sill is important with any foundation type. 
Here you can see it extending past the joist to provide that solid connection. We left quite a few additional connections and callouts out of this detail for clarity. Now those of you who are paying attention might have noticed that we've covered our final detail, but we haven't yet shown any overturning failures. This is because easy to see overturning failures in a home are very rare, and that's probably a good thing. If you have a home that is lightweight with no hold downs, but all of the other connections are strong enough to be picked up, flipped over, and land upside down, those connections are likely overdesigned. We do see overturning failures in homes, but they usually look like a pile of rubble. However, in sheds, we often see a true overturning. Sheds are a complete box that's meant to be transported whole without being damaged. They're often set in a yard and not anchored in any way. This makes them a perfect target for overturning failures like the ones seen here. So now we've gone through all of the details in APA's Building for High Wind Resistance document. The recommendations help provide a complete load path from the top of the structure to the bottom. Let's quickly review the details. First, increase the attachment of your roof sheathing to four inches on center at the panel edges and ends and six inches in the field. And use eight penny ring or screw shank nails. This helps your sheathing stay in place. Next, brace your gable ends at six foot on center with this combination of two by fours, nails, and tension ties that we discussed. This brace helps prevent failures at the hinge in the wall at this location. And sheath those gable ends with wood structural panels at the same four inch on the perimeter and six inch intermediate nail spacing. This not only adds strength and prevents projectile damage, but can act as a nail base for your siding and trim. As we move around the house, anchor your trusses to the top plates with a hurricane or seismic anchor on the exterior of the wall to keep the uplift load path in line. In addition to this, we discussed the need to attach your wall sheathing to both top plates but most importantly, the top, top plate. Moving down the structure, our high wind resistance guidelines at the floor to floor connection are to connect the sheathing from the upper story and lower story to a common rim board. Other options we discussed here included spanning your sheathing over this space and nailing into studs, as well as using straps. Next, make sure that the wall sheathing is attached to the walls with eight penny common nails at four inches on center on the panel edges and six inches in the field. This attachment is above code minimum, but it has a big impact on your walls. And sheath all of your walls, including gable ends and above and below openings with wood structural panels. This allows your house or building to work as a complete box instead of bits and pieces of one. It also helps greatly with projectile loads and can be used as a nail base for siding, trim, and even brick ties which eliminates the need to hit a stud during their installation. Next, make sure your wall sheathing is extended to the sill plate and is nailed at a recommended four inches on center to that sill. This is an error that we see much too often and the impact it has on the structure is huge. And finally, install half inch anchor bolts at 32 to 48 inches on center and secure them with a three by three plate washer. Our publication will help prevent failures like we see in these pictures. A lot of the failures we observe are due to poor construction instead of high wind speeds. In the photo on the left, you can see the home experienced significant damage, likely due to garage pressurization, but as we discussed earlier, that fence is still standing. The home on the right has a crack in the brick veneer at the corner, likely due to the flexibility of the structure, but the wreath is still hanging on the home, and the fence in the backyard seem to be in pretty good shape. Ideally, we would have lots of failures to fences, trees, and wreaths well before we had home failures. Throughout this presentation, I've mentioned a variety of APA publications. Our website is one of our most powerful tools, and all of our publications can be downloaded from the website with a free registration. If you've never been to our website, please take the time to explore it. The link shown here will take you directly to our High Wind page, or of course, you can always visit our main page at www.apawood.org. Thank you very much for attending today. At this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Tom, who's been monitoring questions for me throughout the session. Thanks, Mary, that was really good. Um, I want, before we get into the questions, I just wanna mention 
if you are at the APA website, that publication that Mary has referred to is form number M310, if you're interested in downloading that. So we had some questions come in while you were speaking, Mary, and let's get to some of those. There are a lot of storms throughout the country. How do you select which ones to observe? That's a great question. We evaluate storms on a case-by-case -case basis. For us, we feel like we can learn the most by looking at recently constructed homes. It allows us to evaluate the performance of homes that are built under recent building codes. Today's homes are bigger with more windows and fewer interior walls to help resist the loads caused by storms. So looking at, at homes as they're currently built can teach us a lot. Okay. Can you provide us with some other examples of degrees of damage uh, that are used to assess the strength of a tornado? I can. I mentioned that the two that we use are one and two family residences and hardwood trees most of the time. Some of the other ones include small barns, um, farm outbuildings, big box retail buildings, warehouses, softwood trees, gas station canopies. It's just a variety of different types of structures and things that are damaged. Okay. Is there a single item that you can pinpoint as the most common failure? It is nearly impossible to pinpoint a single most common failure, but most of them do happen at a connection point. And I've seen a lot of failures lately at sill and top plates. Um, the connection of a structural sheathing like wood structural panels to the sill and top plates along the entire perimeter while above code really helps improve performance and prevents that interior pressurization we discussed. Okay, do you think the brick veneer failures shown are due mostly to misinstallation? We do see a lot of misinstallation, often due to either a lack of brick ties or improperly installed brick ties, but it's not all of the failures we observe. So all structures do move during wind events, which is actually a good thing. Um, and tornadoes are a severe example of, that, of a wind event. So often we see cracking in brick veneer due to a deflection of the structure behind it. Uh, we've seen this in a few storm observations lately. The more flexible the home, the more severe the cracks tend to be. Okay, and this next question is gonna call on your skills to verbally describe or a picture for us. Uh, could you clarify what staples installed parallel to the framing looks like versus perpendicular to the roof framing? I think there was just a confusion of what parallel to framing meant. I can. Let's see how good I am at, at drawing a picture here. So if, let's think about staples on a wall. So you have a stud that's running vertically up and down and you have a one and a half inch area to, stay, to attach to. If you in, attach your staple so that it's running horizontally, so that you have legs that are the same height off the ground, your chances of one of those legs missing that one and a half inch space is huge. If you turn your staple so it's oriented in the same direction as the wall stud, you're more likely to get both of those legs into the member. Same is true on walls and roofs. Okay, I know we're running a little over. I'll do one last question. Plywood and OSB are eight feet long. How does one fasten into a rim joist or lap all the plates when the distance required is more than more than 96 inches? There are a couple of ways to do that. There are oversized panels that are provided in a, by a number of manufacturers. So you can either order an oversized panel or you can rotate your panels horizontally and you know have a four foot strip on the bottom and then maybe an eight foot one that goes all the way up or connect to the common ones. Um, every home is different and the geometry in every one is different, but those are two options that do work. Okay, thanks Mary. We should uh, wrap up here. I should mention that if you have technical questions on any topic related to the use of engineered wood products, don't hesitate to contact the APA help desk, the address shown here. And before we conclude, I'd like to touch on three quick things related to a short survey, CEUs, and upcoming webinars. 
We'd really appreciate receiving your feedback via the survey that you will receive shortly. So please take a minute to fill that out. And also don't forget to download the AIA or ICC certificates of completion from the links in the follow-up email that will be sent to you. And finally, make sure that you are signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of our next webinar, as well as future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. You'll receive it. Uh, to receive it, you need to uh, go to the APA webpage. And starting from the uh, home page, go to the sign in in the upper right hand corner. In the menu that drops down, simply select register. And from there, you will need to let us know what you'd specifically like to receive, which in this case is the APA update newsletter. Many of you have asked today if a handout of the slides is available. And uh, what we'll do is we will have a recording of today's webinar, as well as answers to questions <clears throat> that were asked, and many of which we didn't get to. We'll post those all at the apawood.org website in a week or two. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending and have a great weekend.